Good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this opening session of our conference on the Johnson government's constitutional agenda. Jointly hosted by the Constitution Unit at University College London, the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford and the UK in a changing Europe. My name is Meg Russell. I'm the director of the Constitution Unit and also a senior fellow at the UK in a changing Europe. We've got a packed program of excellent panels taking place this morning and tomorrow morning with a really high quality collection of speakers from the political and the academic world. I'm particularly delighted that we're kicking off the conference with a keynote address from the Lord Chancellor, Robert Buckland. We're enormously grateful to you, Lord Chancellor, for joining us today. Robert Buckland has been Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice since July 2019. Before that, he was a Minister of State at the Ministry of Justice and previously Solicitor General. So he's had a really good vantage point to think about the state of our constitution and some of the upheavals of these Brexit years. He'll address us for about 25 minutes before we open up the, the session to questions. I may ask one or two questions myself from the chair, but we also strongly encourage you to put in questions from the audience. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please write it in the Q&A function of Zoom, as opposed to the chat. Our Q&A facilitator, the Constitution Unit Deputy Director, Alan Rennick, will then select a range of questions and ask them on your behalf. If you want your question to be asked anonymously, please state that when you write it, and Alan will be careful to do so. This whole session, uh, including the Q&A, is being recorded and we'll post it afterwards on our websites, YouTube channels and podcasts for the Constitution Unit and Oxford's Department of Politics and International Relations. We'll let you know when the recording's available and we hope you might want to share it with others. But that's enough from me. Let me pass over to Robert Butland, Lord Chancellor, to address you. We greatly look forward to what you've got to say and to the questions afterwards. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Russell, and thank you to UCL for organising this conference and inviting me. It's a huge pleasure to join you in what I hope will be one of the last fully virtual events. And as the vaccination programme continues to roll out at incredible pace, we're all looking forward to life returning to some semblance of normality. Now, as that occurs, I have three priorities for getting the justice system back on its feet and continuing to deliver our agenda for change in the justice system, which is integral to our society. So first of all, I want to ensure that we recover justice from the effects of the pandemic and get it firing on all cylinders again, so that it can work through the uh, larger than usual accumulation of cases that are waiting to be heard so that we can deliver justice that is timely. Secondly, I want to rebuild the justice system so that it's smarter in the ways that it deals with reoffending, for example, so that it has stronger infrastructure to deliver a more modern service, and so that it is fairer in the way it treats victims and the professionals who keep our system working. And third, I want to restore law and justice to their rightful place at the heart of our society. And this means looking again at our human rights framework, for example, our relationship, the relationship between Parliament and the courts, to ensure that they continue to work as the public would want and expect. It's the third of these elements, restoration, on which I will focus my remarks today. Now, as you know, the Office of Lord Chancellor has evolved and changed over many, many centuries. Whilst it's something of a personal relief that the title Keeper of the King's Conscience is no longer in the job description, the office continues to have a hugely important constitutional role in maintaining that incredibly fine balance that exists between our institutions and the way in which they make, shape and enforce the law. And in our 2019 manifesto, we outlined plans that uh, to the way that we wanted to look again at our, how our democracy operates and to restore uh, trust in our institutions. And that's a process that's taking place right across government. And I'm quite certain that colleagues at the conference today and tomorrow will look at themes such as the Fixed Term Parliaments Act and how its change <laughs> or appeal could affect our political landscape and the importance of maintaining electoral integrity so that, for example, polling is protected from fraud. Some have suggested that the government's agenda is some sort of authoritarian executive power grab. But I think your UCL colleague, Professor Con Kaitha, got it right when he said 
that we're attempting to return to the political constitution model that was the orthodoxy for much of the 20th century. Now, for my part as Lord Chancellor, I set up the Independent Human Rights Act review to look at this important piece of legislation and now that it has been in place for uh, two decades and whether or not it continues to meet in every respect the needs of our society. And of course, uh, I have already set up and uh, overseen the independent review into administrative law, which examined whether judicial review continues to protect the rights of individuals against an overbearing state and whether it is frankly being abused in order to conduct politics by other means. Now that latter uh, uh, report it is of course going to result in legislation. And I hope to be able to speak more about that in due course when the necessary stages of consultation and response have been reached. Now recently I spoke at a conference at Queen Mary University. And as I set out in my speech there, I think it is also time for us to re-examine the 2005 Constitutional Reform Act. Now that's a piece of legislation that made quite sweeping changes to the role of Lord Chancellor, which had always been that linchpin between legislature, executive and judiciary. Now that uh, change was really forcefully brought home to me when I accepted this role nearly two years ago and was immediately obliged to resign as a part-time judge. Now, the 2005 Act was, I believe, attempting to answer questions about a, an imagined idea of a clear separation of powers. Now, I, I believe firmly that that reading of our system is an ill-informed one. What we actually have is a system based on checks and balances. Now, I'm determined that my successors in this role should have the confidence that their powers are clear and that their relationship with the other branches of the constitution are, is fully understood by all. Now the review is all about taking a careful look at what has happened since 2005, and whether we've uh, lost anything from the role that could diminish it as it continues to evolve, and whether there is scope to clarify its responsibilities to make it more workable in the future. Now, of course I accept that governments are far from perfect, no matter what their political complexion. And it's not difficult to find instances where mistakes with the use of power have been made in our country. But it doesn't mean that governments have an insatiable appetite for power. The reality is that with more power comes more responsibility. And even government itself only has so much capacity. This I firmly believe from my own lived experience is a check on power in itself. Now, judicial review is, of course, another vital check on unbridled power. And it's precisely for this reason that we should carefully review how it operates to ensure that there remains that essential balance between Parliament and our courts. Whilst there are those who would say that there are too few occasions when the process of judicial review goes wrong uh, and that this exercise is somehow a waste of energy, I would say that we have a clear responsibility as custodians of our constitution to make it work as well as possible for as much of the time as possible. And when I say we, I'm talking about all of us, parliament, the executive and the judiciary. It's a collective responsibility. And the way we arrive at solutions is through dialogue, whether that plays out in parliament, the courts, or indeed in government. In the final analysis, however, we should be crystal clear that the executive and judiciary are servants of parliament, which derives its authority from the people. And ultimately, this is the place where all the debates culminate. I, th I think it's unhelpful, frankly, to be drawn into arguments about where power is derived from. And anyone who would make out that I've relegated the jury to uh, the judiciary, forgive me, to mere servants has frankly missed the point. As a member of the executive, I understand my clear role as a servant of parliament. In any event, our preoccupation should be with intent, not function. So for example, what parliament intended for the powers it gives to others. Uh, now I believe there are two important parts to this. In a democracy as mature and complex as ours, where any gaps in legislation will naturally be filled, Parliamentarians have a responsibility to ensure that laws are carefully drafted and therefore to avoid situations where judges are called upon 
to adjudicate on avoidable ambiguity. Now, at the same time, it's incumbent upon our judges to be cautious in their decision making and to ensure that their judgments properly reflect the intent of our elected parliament. Now, in this regard, all of us have a responsibility to maintain that balance. And like any minister of the Crown, I have a general responsibility to ensure that statutes passed through parliament continue to be consistent with the rule of law. It's also my responsibility, along with the leader of the House of Commons, as chair of the Parliamentary Business and Legislation Committee of Cabinet, to cajole and to encourage each and every government department to consider whether the legislation they put before it is properly thought through, well drafted, unlikely to export policy questions to the courts, and is consistent with the rule of law. I'll give you an example. The mental health provisions of the Coronavirus Act of last year, uh, what happened with them was that ultimately it was decided that as those measures were not in, in, effect, in fact used, it made abundant sense not to renew them. Now that review uh, enshrined in the legislation was an extremely useful uh, process and it was proportionate to the need at the time. It meant that renewal of that act uh, as a whole was not simply a, a rubber stamp exercise. That should never happen without regard and proper regard to the rule of law. And indeed, one of the core functions of the law officers of the Crown, uh, and of course, having been Solicitor General, I'm well familiar with its practice, is to make sure that the government acts lawfully and that it respects the rule of law. So for example, if the government wants to propose retrospective legislation, this requires the consent of the law officers. Now that ensures a respect for the principle of no excessive use of retrospective legislation, which is a core component of the rule of law and that certainty, which is an essential element. But as the minister leading the Ministry of Justice, I believe it's incumbent upon me to ensure that the rule of law itself cannot be misused to in effect weaponize the courts against political decision making. It's worthwhile therefore, to examine precisely what is meant by that term, the rule of law. Now, in the modern context, there is, I believe, some confusion about what the rule of law really means. Now, it's true that there are a number of interpretations and potential component parts, but my worry, frankly, is that it has become the victim of a form of conceptual creep, which leaves it open to hijack from politically motivated interests. Now, the effect this is having is to set up a false dichotomy between the rule of law and parliamentary supremacy itself. The task of the courts in interpreting legislation is to give effect to the intention of parliament. This is done by looking at the words of the statute in context. And as part of this exercise, courts will use certain general presumptions. Now, some of these presumptions can be said to reflect the value of the rule of law. For example, it can be seen by the presumption against retrospective legislation. And as Benyon puts it, the rule is as follows in three parts. Firstly, that unless the contrary intention appears, an enactment is presumed not to be intended to have a retrospective effect operation. Secondly, the strength of the presumption varies from case to case, depending on the degree of unfairness that would result from giving that enactment retrospective effect. And finally, greater the unfairness, the clearer the language required to rebut the presumption. Now, there are a couple of points to make about this. First of all, that the presumption helps to ensure compliance with the rule of law. Second, that the presumption can be said to reflect Parliament's general intentions. And thirdly, that that presumption is in itself rebuttable. And indeed, where the legislation is expressly retrospective, the courts will give effect to it, even if they think it might be unfair. Now, the law officers play an important role here through the consent process, as I mentioned, and they give impartial and invaluable legal advice as independent guardians of the rule of law within government. Now, a number of other presumptions and rules of interpretation can be said to give effect to the rule of law. There's also the principle of legality, according to which legislation, and in particular vague and general words, will be presumed not to be contrary to certain fundamental rights and principles. Now, on a high level of generality, that's perfectly proper. But as the late Sir John Laws put it, and I quote, the rule of law is a protean conception. Different meanings have been variously ascribed to it. 
It possesses many different facets and has generated an enormous literature, end of quote. So the rule of law itself is not a, a legal concept. It's a concept of political morality about the way in which we are and should be governed. Although it is a political principle, it's one which is above and must always be above party politics. A commitment to the rule of law is something which we all share. Now this makes it an extremely powerful concept and a failure to abide by it gives rise to criticisms which are not grounded in mere party politics. Now this has given rise to the possibility of abuse in political debates. Those of both the left and the right have tried to read controversial political values into it. Hayek railed against the notion that policies such as the welfare state could be defended on the grounds that social justice was a requirement of the rule of law. Dicey uh, thought that administrative discretion was incompatible with it, which for him meant that government involvement in the running of the economy, for example, by issuing of licenses, was improper. Now, this sort of argument suggests that the party political view of one group are themselves incompatible with the basic principles of our legal system, therefore characterizing them as illegitimate without the need to engage with them on their merits. Now, doesn't this amount to moving the goalposts so that no matter the will of the people, no matter the will of parliament, a political result that is deemed undesirable by one side or the other can be deemed illegitimate in the name of the rule of law, no matter how loosely connected with, to the concept it really is. Now, that's not to say that the courts must never play a role. Of course, they should do so where it is right and proper. And there will always exist a natural tension in that possibility. The question is how we respond to it. Part five of the UK Internal Markets Bill is a classic example where that tension became abundantly clear. Now, some of the arguments around it were political ones, but the problem was that they were framed incorrectly in a constitutional way almost as if to suggest that they were somehow more fundamental than they really were. In all too rapid a succession of events, observations about the rule of law soon descended into allegations of breaking the law, which is an entirely different thing. It is, I believe, perfectly possible to avoid that sort of wrangling by being much clearer about what the rule of law means and how it interacts with policy. Political positions are not and should not be the preoccupation of the rule of law. Anyone who attempts to characterize them as such is, in my view, overreaching. This is an example of what Professor Tassoulis called conceptual overreach. And according to him, this occurs where, and I quote, a particular concept undergoes a process of expansion or inflation in which it, it absorbs ideas and demands that are foreign to it. The ultimate consequence of, of it is that a single concept is taken to offer a comprehensive political ideology. Uh, and he points out that this runs the risk of diluting these concept, concepts and also that it makes public debate more difficult, uh, I quote, because it makes it difficult to find any point of common ground or shared understanding with those we disagree with. Now, in the context of statutory interpretation, there's another danger to guard against. If the courts end up reading too much into the rule of law, we could get into a situation where they do not give effect to Parliament's intention because they applied the presumption when it shouldn't have been applied. Now, when adopting a strained interpretation on the grounds that not to do so would lead to an outcome that is contrary to legal policy, the courts are on much stronger grounds when assessing the requirements of the rule of law, where it is uncontroversial that one possible outcome in a case would be an unfair one. So take, for example, the Queen and Registrar General, uh, where a convicted murderer applied to get the name of his birth mother under the Adoption Act. Now, the terms of the statute were absolute. However, there was a real risk that he might cause serious harm or even worse to her if he obtained that information. Now, the Court of Appeal held that notwithstanding the absolute terms of that statute, the court should presume that Parliament did not intend for such a result, as it would quite clearly be against public policy. Now, in the absence of any evidence that Parliament had addressed its mind to that issue, the court interpreted the statute as not requiring disclosure. Now, I think we can all recognise there that disclosure would have been unjust. There's no need to appeal to 
contested premises for this. So the courts are on safe territory, I believe, for using this as a trigger for saying we won't allow the outcome unless we can be sure that Parliament really intended it. But the situation is otherwise when it comes to other decisions where the rule of law has been invoked. In the case of Privacy International, there was a disagreement between the majority and the minority on whether it could be consistent with the rule of law to allow the Investigatory Powers Tribunal to make ordinary errors of law. And in Evans, there was a disagreement between the majority and the minority on whether the rule of law was infringed by the ministerial veto provision under the Freedom of Information Act. Now, in both cases, this led the majority to require the clearest words, which weren't present, to give the effect intended by the government. By contrast, the minority applied a more natural interpretation to those provisions. Now, of course, with any principle, there, there are going to be borderline cases in terms of how it's applied. But these cases were not instances of everyone agreeing on the applicable concept. Realising that its application was borderline and then coming out on different sides of the line. No, it, rather, there was a substantive disagreement about what the relevant principles were. And that disagreement was obscured by the use of the term rule of law. In Privacy International, Lord Carnworth thought that it was important to ensure that the law applied by the specialist tribunal is not developed in isolation, to coin a phrase, a local law that conforms to the general law of the land. Now, Lord Sumption didn't share that view or apply that principle, and neither did Lord Wilson. But it's also noteworthy that in Privacy International and in Evans, those who dissented thought that the meaning was perfectly clear, but those in the majority did not. And why is this important? Because legislating is an act of communicating to the courts what the legislature, legislature intends. For such communication to be possible, it is necessary to speak the same language. Provided that there is a shared understanding of what, when certain interpretive provision, presumptions apply and what level of clarity is required to rebut the presumption, then there is no difficulty. But for things like the presumption against retrospectivity, this is perfectly clear. But the more high level the presumption is stated at, such as, by appeal to protean concepts like the rule of law or fundamental common law rights, the more difficulty this causes. In such cases, there is a great degree of scope for reasonable disagreement over whether the rule of law has been infringed. After all, when enacting the provisions at issue in Privacy International and Evans, Parliament did not believe that it was infringing the rule of law, and indeed the judges in the minority in both cases agreed. It was also perfectly clear, as the minority recognised, what Parliament actually intended. Provided Parliament's assessment was not wholly unreasonable, it doesn't appear to me to be right to frustrate that intention by, in the absence of the clearest possible words, saying that actually this does breach the rule of law, and so a presumption against the interpretation applies, and it can only be rebutted by words that are even clearer as to what Parliament, uh, even clearer to what Parliament has used. There is a, here, I think, a, an interesting contrast with the Human Rights Act. It's true that in the vast majority of cases, Parliament believes that the legislation it enacts is compatible with convention rights. Nonetheless, the courts can disagree and can read down the provision to ensure compatibility. But importantly, they can do so because Parliament has given them that power, the power to determine whether legislation is compatible with the convention and indeed the power to read it down. This is what makes it legitimate. However, Section 1 of the 05 Constitutional Reform Act cannot be said that to enact something, to enact something similar with regard to the rule of law. The case law on all of this is in a, a state of flux. You can see, for example, the careful judgments of uh, Lord Reed and Lord Carnworth in El Ghazuli. And there is plenty of very good academic commentary on this such as Professor Varahas's recent article on the principle of legality in the Cambridge Law Journal. Now, together, taking all of this together, gives me a very high degree of confidence that the courts will indeed end up in a benign and a stable position. And I would like us to end up in a position where the courts only read down legislation in cases where there is a clear and unarguable breach of the core components of the rule of law. And this shouldn't be a controversial position for a Lord Chancellor to take. 
but we have seen through the responses to the judicial review consultation that there are questions around it. No doubt from some who are inclined to uh, use the noble principle of the rule of law as a means to further a political agenda. Now, if we are to protect the rule of law from becoming a political football, then we must ensure that its focus continues to be laser sharp, rather than allowing it to become amplified as a weapon to fight battles of politics. It is a concept which is quite rightly above party politics. It exists to protect the principles of justice, not to advance somebody's political agenda. What I'm really saying is that I want to restore what was at one time the very, frankly, conventional thinking that Parliament makes laws that give power to the executive, which are checked by the judiciary. I'm not saying that I've got all the answers, but when given the opportunity to address some of our foremost thinkers on our constitution, I really hope that it's possible to open up a debate about the rule of law and what sovereignty means today. And my view is that we diminish the former by allowing it to be applied in that overtly political way. And we damage the latter by expecting the courts to adjudicate on the express will and intent of parliament. What this does is force judges to become politicians by proxy, to answer difficult political questions by applying disparate legal principles. My aim is quite simple. It's to protect the courts from this unsatisfactory state of affairs and to prevent them from being dragged into politics by another name. As a former part-time member of the judiciary, I think it's a noble endeavour. And as a member of this government, I believe it can restore the balance that we've always managed to maintain in the past without losing one of our most important and cherished checks on the power of the state. I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, you managed to combine there a very wide ranging talk with also a really in-depth discussion of some areas of detail. We appreciate that. And I think you're, you're providing us a very nice lead into our next panel, which is going to be all about the um, issues of judicial review and human rights. Um, I can see we've got some good questions coming in. I would encourage people, there's still time to get your question in um, if you would like to ask a question of the Lord Chancellor. I'll invite uh, Alan to come in uh, with some of those questions in just a moment. But I wonder whether I could just engage you uh, on one, maybe one question on the broad picture and then maybe one question on the detail if we've, if we've got time. You suggested in the talk that maybe some people have sort of mischaracterized what the government is trying to do on the constitution when you referred to my UCL colleague, Colm O'Caneda, for example, um, who, who you were not accusing of doing that, I hasten to add. Um, and if you look back to the Labour government of 1997, which is another government that came to power with a broad kind of constitutional reform agenda, that government was often accused of piecemeal reform, of not articulating a vision of what it all added up to. And of course, you originally had the proposal of the Democracy, Constitution and Rights Commission, which has been abandoned in favor of more sort of piecemeal, if you like, commissions. So I wonder if you think you're being mischaracterized, whether you yourself could characterize what you think the broad direction of travel is on the Constitution, which is, you know, we're trying to cover the full ground at this conference. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mega. And the first, the answer, direct answer to your question is that I'm trying in my speech today, my speech to Queen Mary last month or two months ago, to enunciate and outline a, a potential direction of travel that the government wishes to take. Uh, we were faced, I think, with quite an interesting choice in terms of running a, 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 a quite a wide ranging constitutional convention, which on one level would be extremely attractive and no doubt a, a very uh, you know, rich pond for all of us on this call to have fished in and to have swum in and worked in. But having thought about it very, very carefully, I came to the view that bearing in mind the way in which change would come about would have to be primarily, almost overwhelmingly through statutory change, that actually it would be better to look and to ask for uh, uh, particular panels to look at certain aspects of uh, what we would all regard as constitutional issues. And that's why I came to the conclusion that it was important that we uh, started work with regard to administrative law. Uh, we then had a separate panel on the Human Rights Act, but that the product of that would indeed be, be coherent. 
And whilst I accept that uh, there is always a risk in doing things in stages, that perhaps consequences that were not foreseen uh, then come about, uh, I, I can give you the assurance that I will be working very hard to make sure that there is that statutory or uh, legislative coherence to all of this. But at the same time, through um, the speeches that I'm making uh, through this year, to outline the wider piece of work I think we need to do, particularly with the 05 Act. Again, the, what I'm envisaging with regard to that Act is, is, a, is a proper consultative process, which might take a bit of time, but which I think will uh, uh, create greater benefit. I certainly don't want to go back to uh, a time when, and I think you know, they themselves, the participants themselves regretted it, there was an announcement abolishing the Office of Lord Chancellor by press release, for example, which you know, was hastily withdrawn, but still was quite a damaging way of, of approaching this. And you know, whilst I think you're quite right to challenge me on, on coherence, uh, I, I, I'm trying to take a more painstaking approach uh, to, to avoid the, 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 the legitimate criticism that somehow the government is just forcing things through without thinking about it. Mm. And I suppose the theme that does come across from your talk is um, if, if there's one guiding principle, maybe it's returning power to Parliament, which for somebody like me is, 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 is you know, music to my ears. Um, but the concerns that have been expressed, and I think we've got a question on, on this that I've seen um, coming up in the chat, that it, it, whether, whether it's an executive power grab or whether it's returning power to Parliament is a sort of finely balanced thing sometimes. Let me ask you a, a, a question on the judicial side, which is not my side, but a question that a lot of people have been asking. We've obviously got Lord Fawkes coming up on the next panel with some very eminent commentators, Lord Fawkes, who led the uh, independent review of administrative law, which you said in your talk will result in legislation. Um, but of course, after the Fawkes report had been published, um, the government reopened consultation and we're now not quite sure what's going to be in the legislation. Could you explain that process and yes. you know why, why, why it happened like that and when we're going to know the direction? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I wanted to run it in specific stages. It was clear that uh, Lord Folkes' work had to be rigorously independent and the balance of the panel I think was the right one. He didn't suggest a particular direction of travel in any direction. I thought it was a very carefully chosen, a deliberately carefully chosen panel to absolutely convey the correct uh, impression and indeed the correct reality that I wanted you know, it to work in a free and unfettered and independent way. Uh, and that happened. Uh, and uh, you know, everybody I think agrees, even if they might not agree with everything that the panel reported on, that the quality of the report is a very good one. Um, I think, though, it's right, you know, the, the government, um, having been elected on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a specific manifesto uh, pledge, is, does have the space to then consult further about other ideas and proposals it might have. And I think it would be, I think, frankly, wrong to say that, um, you know, the government therefore would have to be a slave to the review. You know, the review has been a really important part of it and uh, continues to be so but it isn't everything. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to avoid was uh, certainly you know, legitimate criticism that somehow then we would just boat things on that we thought were, were interesting and convenient without any consultation whatsoever. And that's not happened. Uh, the consultation has been a lively one. It's of course not yet uh, in its formal sense over, though the, the period is finished, the government is still uh, looking carefully at it and working out its detailed response. Um, and that should, and I would expect, will result in some legislation. And I think you forgive me today, Professor Russell, if I don't go through the detail of it, uh, because you know, I'm still working very carefully uh, on it. Lots of interesting issues about remedy, uh, which you know, I can assure you and, the, and everybody listening, I'm looking at extremely carefully, uh, and also work being done to understand what the operational impact of all of this might be as well. So, you know, whatever our views of the final product, I can assure you, it is uh, going to be the result of very careful uh, thinking and indeed internal scrutiny uh, before its publication. Thank you very much. Yeah. I feel I've kept you for too long. Um, let's pass over to Alan, who's been scooping up um, um, what I'm sure are some excellent questions from the audience. Alan. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you. Yes, indeed, there have been lots of very good questions. Uh, given that, and given that time is limited, let me put a group of three questions, if I may, and we'll see how far we can get. So there have been a number of questions picking up on what you said about the role of the courts versus the role of parliament. Uh, let me just read one of those from Gary Wilson. Mm. The Lord Chancellor seems to place great emphasis on the role of parliament in the constitution on the basis that it derives its authority from the people. How does he square this with the fact that Parliament, for most purposes, can be effectively equated with a governing party able to force through an agenda which a clear majority of voters rejected in the previous general election. Mm -hmm. Then a uh, second question in this batch is from uh, Jonathan Jones, who says, if I heard correctly, the Lord Chancellor suggested that over the Internal Markets Bill, there was confusion between the rule of law and breaking the law. Can he explain further? The government admitted it was breaking international law. Isn't it also incompatible with the rule of law for the government deliberately to pursue a course which breaks the law? And then finally, um, uh, Timothy Sayer had uh, quite a long question which I won't attempt to read out in full but I'll uh, I'll flag it so that everyone uh, can see it. Uh, he said the Lord Chancellor refers to ensuring Parliament's intention behind statute is given effect but that smooths over the complexity of how that intention can be identified. The issues are well known and he goes on to say uh, can the Lord Chancellor give an example of where the courts have gone too far? Thank you very much. Pretty meaty questions there. Good luck, uh, Lord Chancellor, in answering them. <laughs> Thank you very much. I went to the first question about, you know, it's, 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 it's an important question about, you know, Parliament and the executive. Are they, in effect, the same thing, particularly where you have a large majority? I don't believe they are, uh, uh, for two reasons. One, I do not accept the, um, I think, the, the sort of prevailing narrative that has um, sort of almost taken over the, the debate as an assumption the executive is always somehow on the prowl, like a, a, a greedy dinosaur trying to gobble up whatever it can find. You know, from my own, you know, quite lengthy experience now of being in the executive, uh, as I said in my previous speech to Queen Mary, you know, we're very much uh, Prometheus bound, frankly, in terms of capacity, uh, cost, uh, and, um, you know, the, 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 the sheer consequences of taking on more and more power, which I describe as responsibility which is really what it is. Uh, and, and I think that you know, we shouldn't always make that assumption that the executive is somehow always on the make. Yes, clearly an executive that has been elected on the back of a majority wants to try through a legislative agenda, but what's the problem with that? You know, they've been elected. Uh, they're there to get on with the work. Now, there is a question and a legitimate question about the quality of parliamentary, parliamentary scrutiny on whether or not more work needs to be done in order to enhance that. I, I'm in the camp that says a ready yes to that, uh, you know, having been on the other side of it. Um, I do think there's much more that can be done. Uh, but I think that, you know, in, in uh, concepts like uh, pre-legislative scrutiny, for example, draft bills, which we see more and more of, I'm confident that Parliament can actually do this uh, and that we should be, you know, actively encouraging uh, that way forward in, in, in that spirit of confidence and belief in the supremacy of that institution. Now, Jonathan asks, I think, you know, a really interesting question and, and you know, without going through uh, uh, breaking too many confidences, uh, ultimately, uh, the debate at the time of the UKIM was really about stages and about when it was that that conflict, that clash would come. Now, I took the view I took the view that in those very difficult political circumstances uh, where, and I readily admitted that there could indeed be that conflict, that clash of laws, if you like, if certain uh, outcomes uh, were, were pursued and came to pass, that that indeed would uh, obviously cause a legal problem. But I did not, and this is where I think we probably respectfully disagree, I did not accept, or, or in the end, I was not persuaded, by the argument that uh, the uh, preparation or introduction of those proposals necessarily did that, because we weren't at that stage. And if you remember, there were a number of checks and balances that were put in to that legislation, particularly the parliament, or the, what I call the Commons Parliamentary Lock, that actually made the uh, uh, potential application of, of uh, those that, that part uh, even more subject to uh, the will of 
uh, Parliament. And therefore, uh, I, I think that whilst I accept the point that uh, in the end there would have been that conflict, if you like, that breach, um, that, that I, I think is a different argument from whether or not uh, the government or members of it were acting within the political uh, principle and spirit of the rule of law. I accept that it was a very trying time where tensions were very, very deep and indeed stretched in a way that uh, we know some of the consequences about. But ultimately, uh, we saw what happened. What happened was that the contracting parties, that the EU and the UK, actually worked through the system, used the joint committee, and came to a sensible uh, conclusion and uh, an agreement that meant that those provisions were never necessary. Now, you can criticise it as a political um, uh, policy or a, a political uh, tactic or strategy. And of course, there were plenty of arguments about whether or not uh, it should have been introduced at the beginning of the legislation or potentially uh, 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 mentioned as an amendment. You can criticise that as well till the cows come home. But what I do think was that there was some overreach where people were saying that somehow fundamentally the rule of law itself was being challenged as a result of that. And I feel that the events that then unfolded actually vindicated the position that I took. Now, with regard to um, the third question, you're going to forgive me because I have absorbed so much time on those first two points and I need to remind you of it. Um, I wonder if you could just have a reminder again, forgive me. Uh, the, the core part was, can the Lord Chancellor give an example of where the courts have gone too far? Yes. Um, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think where it comes to, I mean, look, I, I'll take evidence, I think, as a, as a good example, where I can understand where ultimately the Supreme Court uh, came to, where, in fact, uh, you know, Evans was a decision made by the then Attorney General about uh, disclosure of Prince of Wales as correspondent. Remember the case? And quite properly, the then attorney relied upon statutory provisions, the ministerial veto, passed by a Labour government, some of the most liberal um, FOI uh, provisions in the world. We remember Tony Blair uh, memorably describing himself as a chump, I think, for having done it. Uh, and quite properly, that attorney general uh, used that power, effectively, which is exceptional power, used very rarely, to say, no, on this occasion, uh, I want to apply the veto. Now, what happened was that. Uh, in effect, the, the clear, I think the clear intention of Parliament was in the end frustrated. Now, I can understand, and I don't criticise the, 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 the motives at all, because I can understand the concern that the Supreme Court had, that a judicial function could in effect be then trumped by, a judicial decision could then be trumped by the executive. I get all of that. But I thought the legislation was pretty clear. Uh, um, therefore, you know, my, my respectful submission on that one would be that that was a decision that I think was 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 not 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 the right one. Uh, of course, it's still the position now, and it's still good law. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I think that's an example where, frankly, I, I was left somewhat puzzled, to say the least, by by where we ended up. Thank you so much. Um, as I think uh, everyone on the panel can see, we are up against time here. I think we could continue this conversation for a very long time. And indeed, to some extent, we will continue it in the next session on judicial review uh, with, with Lord Fawkes um, in just a moment, but unfortunately without Robert Buckland. So um, I'd just like to say on behalf of all of us, Lord Chancellor, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for being open in the answering of questions. Um, and I would like to thank the audience as well for the excellent questions. We didn't get to all of them, but some of them might suit the next session. <laughs>